גם אני לא מתה על זה. אז בכל מקרה, אז שמחים לארח את קרן, שהיא בוגרת שלה, עשתה דוקטורט אצל איתן, היום היא בברוד, עושה פוסט דוקטורט אצל גלי גט, מתעסקת בגנומיקה של סרטן, והיא תדבר על עבודה שקשורה לזה, ובהצלחה. So uh, it's good to be back home. Um, and as Rodet said, I spent the last three and a half years uh, at the group of Gadi Gets, which is mainly focused around the development and application of computational tools in the field of cancer genomics. And today I'm going to mainly uh, talk about one of the, the studies I did there. So I will start by giving you some background uh, to, to cancer genomics and the computational challenges that we have in this field. I will then describe a new method that I've developed uh, to identify the genetic changes that are happening in our cells before cancer arises. I will quickly review the, the second project in the context of resistance uh, to therapy in cancer and uh, we'll discuss uh, also my future plans. So I'm sure I don't need to tell you how complex the human body is, certainly when thinking about the, the brain and the, all the organs and how they all work together. But to me, always the, it was much more overwhelming, this complexity, when looking at the molecular level. Because beyond the enormous amount of cells that we have in the body, each and every one of them has the DNA, which by itself is three billion bits of information. Uh, and from this bits of information, our genes are encoded, which is practically 1% of it, but it's another layer of, of information. From there are proteins, which are the functional units of the cells. And beyond all that, we have more than 100,000 small molecules in our cells, including vitamins, fatty acids, sugars, and more. But they're all working in this dynamic interaction network that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, but we know today that this interaction network and uh, all this uh, information is, is acting different in each and every one of these cells. And we also know today that modifications, changes in this basic code is the, that basically uh, goes way downstream to, to all the functionality of the cell is the basis for, for, all, for many human diseases, such as uh, cystic fibrosis and Huntington, and uh, Crohn's disease, and obviously cancer, which is the, the, the first and the most one, and there are many more. And what's nice about uh, the area, that, the, the era uh, in which we are living in, is that today using novel technologies, we can, we can quantitatively measure a lot of the components in our cells. And this has become a highly challenging and computational challenge. And this challenge is already being acknowledged in the private sector, uh, with many companies around the world, but also specifically here in Israel, that are focused on R&D, uh, healthcare-related R&D, which is, by the way, expected to be the largest R&D spending by 2020. And all of them are taking biological data, whether it's um, factors in our blood, our DNA, the bacteria in our gut, what we eat, our electronic medical records, and you name it. And they're all aiming to, to make sense out of this data and to predict our risk for different diseases, suggest ways that we can change our lifestyle. Uh, some of them are in the context of early detection of cancer, when it's, it's a stage that we know that we can actually help the patient, uh, identify new drug targets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, across, across the board of the, of the different diseases. And to put things in perspective, the reason we are here today uh, is mainly because of one project, a very long one, that ended in uh, 2003, the Human Genome Project, uh, which happened only 50 years after Watson and Crick were able to identify the 3D structure of the DNA, but the sequence was not known at this point. And while this project lasted 13 years and cost $3 billion, the situation today is that we can sequence an entire genome in a few hours and in a cost of around $1,000 which a cost that it would probably decrease even further. And because of that, we, um, we accumulated data, uh, biological data at a petabyte scale. Uh, and specifically, my research is focused on two molecules in this, pro in this process. So first one is the, D the DNA. It's this three billion bits of information. And we know today that 1% of this DNA also encodes uh, our genes, basically the more, f the more functional units of our cells. 
And what I ask mainly, but you will see also specifically, is how does this DNA and RNA changes during the course of the disease? So a quick uh, biological uh, background uh, in the context of DNA and RNA. So if you can, uh, this is, for example, all the sequence of our DNA and specific parts of it, again, only 1%, encodes codes for, for our genes such that um, beyond the, the sequence itself, here we also have copies of the molecule. So for example, we can have four copies of gene A, six copies of gene B, and 1,000 copies of gene C. Um, technically, how does it look like? When I get this data, what do I get? So be before I get it, basically people are taking biopsies. They're extracting the DNA or the RNA from these biopsies, and they're putting it in a sequencing machine. So we get this sequence. But the file looks like that. So this is DNA sequencing data. We get this uh, short read. We call it sequence read. So this is a short pieces of this string that is composed of four letters. And because we have the, the human reference genome, again, sequenced back then in 2003, because we have this reference, we can now map or align these short reads into the big one and know exactly which uh, each and every such uh, read, where did it come from? So we, for example, we, we know that this read is mapped to the genome, to chromosome one, at position one, six, four, whatever, and so on and so forth. Now, RNA sequencing is very similar because it's, again, it's sequencing reads. But here we have another layer of information. So beyond the short sequencing read and that we know their position, we also can tell, for example, that these three reads are all in the region of gene A. And we, we can count how many reads are mapped into this area and basically assign it a number. So again, four reads of gene A, six reads of gene B, and this number, this quantity, basically tells us how active the gene is. And this is as biological functions, uh, meaning, sorry, downstream. Now, before I go uh, specifically into my work, I want to introduce you, we just need another layer of information uh, that I want to tell you about. And this, this is in the context of changes in the DNA, because each and every one of us in the room is obviously different, and we are mainly different because our DNA is different. But in what way? So there are two types of what we call uh, mutation, gene mutations. So the first one is called a germline mutation. What is a germline mutation? This is a change uh, from what we familiar from the reference genome that is happening in each and every one of our cells. Uh, and this is exactly what makes each and every one of us uh, unique. So for example, if you look on these three different people, there are 10 million positions within the three billion that we will have different uh, base. This base is, is again, is one of these four letters. So for example, the green and the, the red person here both have A, but the blue man has a C. Uh, here the, the green and the blue have C, but the, um, but the red one is a T. So overall we have 10 million such positions in the genome that each and every one of us is different in a different combination. Uh, this is basically the natural variation and unless we inherited something that is causing a disease, these mutations are, are uh, mainly harmful, uh, don't, don't have any deleterious effect. However, there's another type of change that can happen in the DNA, and it basically can happen in each and every one of our cells independently after the fertilization is done. So for example, we can take again the blue man, and we will see that the DNA might be a bit different between some of his skin samples, and liver samples, and colon samples. These are called somatic mutations because they're happening in our cells after the fertilization. Um, they are much more rare. The, there's not 10 million positions uh, in the genome. Um, we mainly see them in cancer. We see many of them in cancer, but they are accumulated also as we age, simply because our DNA is replicated and there are spontaneous mistakes. In, the, in this replication process. So we accumulate mutations, and we know today that these mutations are a big part of our aging, pro aging uh, process that basically makes our cells less fit uh, as they were uh, when we were younger. So, and as opposed to, to this type of mutations, indeed, this one may have a deleterious effect. Now, what is cancer? So cancer starts with a normal cell, a completely normal cell. 
that replicates and start to accumulate mutations from, for different reasons. So one is the case is that we already inherited something that is, uh, that is causing the disease or is related to the disease. But these are the more rare cases. Mainly the reason why our cells accumulate these mutations is either because of uh, exposure to different carcinogens and environmental factors, or again, as I said, just spontaneous mutations that occur in our DNA. But this accumulation can come to a point where the functionality of the cell is, becoming, is, uh, is affected, such that the cell uh, now proliferate much, much faster and can also move and metastasize to different organs. This is what's happening in the disease. And in recent years, we, you probably don't know that, but, but we gain enormous amount of new information about the genetics of cancer. And this is because, mainly because of these two projects, but, but more. Uh, one, of, one of them is called the Cancer Genome Atlas, and one is the International Cancer Genome Consortium that sequenced around overall uh, 20 to 25 um, biopsies from, from, cancer, from cancer patients and basically looked at the changes that are happening in their DNA. That is something that we did not have before the, this new sequencing technologies that, that we had only in the, over the last decade or, or so. And the, the general approach uh, in, in this project was, okay, first take the individual, take a biopsy or a mat, again, do this process, sequ you, you take the biopsy, you extract the DNA, the RNA, and you sequence the, this information. And now using a specific computational method that, that I will uh, present in, in a second, we can identify what is this, what are the germline mutations that this individual have? What is the somatic mutations? Another thing that happens in disease is, bef is beyond these mutations, sometimes specific chromosome, chromosomal regions or an entire chromosome can be duplicated or deleted. So now we have only one copy of chromosome one. And we see a lot of these aberrations in the disease. But the, the first thing we do is we do it at the individual level. And now we take it to the populational level. So for example, we look on all uh, patients that have breast cancer and we look for um, for genetic events that are repetitive, that we see them more than we would expect by random, given some parameters. And these, these cases that we see, for example, a mutation that is happening, I don't know, in 50, 60, 70% of the patients, this implies to us that it might be causal. And this is a first, it can be predictor of who will uh, develop the disease and also a drug target. This is something that we want to target in order to kill these cells. And indeed, I want to quickly review, to, to get you into this field, uh, three different methods developed uh, in both in Gaddis lab, but, but also in other labs. Now that we get this sequence, how do we find these mutations? If we found a mutation, how do we know how to tell what are the, which one are the important ones? And what, what generated them? What biological process? So I'm going to talk on each and every one of them uh, separately. And the first one is indeed the challenge of identifying somatic mutations in these sequences. So this is what we get. This is the input. Again, we have the human reference genome. And visually, all the, these short reads that I showed you at the beginning, they are uh, represented here as this, um, this gray, these gray lines. And this is, this is the, their mapping to the, to, the, to the reference genome. So for example, this read, is mapped from this position to this position. Now we are looking at a specific position in the, in the genome. We know that in the reference genome, we see a C here. But when we look on, on our patient here, uh, we see mainly the gray. The gray means that it's the same as the reference genome, so it's mainly C. But there are, uh, in this case, actually, let's say it's four. So there are four positions where this patient has a G. So what does it mean? So the first thing that we know is that the frequency of this mutation is 20%. And the meaning of it is that 20% that of the cells that we took from this individual have this mutation. So, but we suspect that this mutation, is it a real mutation? How can we tell? So there are two options. Uh, one, that this is a germline mutation. And what do I mean by that? If we will look now on other cells in this individual, we will see that he'd have G in this position in all of his cells. 
because this is one, this is the natural variation, this is something he was born with. So the way to, to, to examine that is to take a reference from the same individual, right? The easiest way to do that, because we don't want to do anything invasive, is to take a blood, to draw a blood sample and sequence the blood. And for example, for in this case, we saw that this individual does not have a G here. So this is not a germline mutation. This is still a candidate to be a somatic mutation. The other option, however, is that there's still no mutation here. And what we see is basically a result of sequencing error. The machine that does the sequencing, it's sometimes wrong. Actually, it can be very wrong in some, in some positions. Or it can be a mapping problem. The, the algorithm that mapped these specific reads to this region was wrong. Maybe there might be the case that there is another place in the genome that this read is more uh, fit for. So basically, identifying somatic mutation from sequencing noise, uh, from sequencing data is a signal to noise problem. And mutex is one of the methods that were developed to, um, to address this problem. So, but indeed, the first feature of it is comparing to this blood sample uh, from the individual to filter germline events. Uh, but beyond that, it basically applies a Bayesian classifier uh, that is based on a log likelihood score, which uh, examines the likelihood of two models. One, that the model M M0, in which there is no real variant here, and the, what we see is basically a result of sequencing noise. And the other one, that there is a real mutation here. And generally, the model takes into account the frequency of the mutation and the error rate of this specific position that we know. For each and every position, we know what's the error rate. And overall, this method was shown to have 95% validation rate, meaning 95% of the mutation uh, of the calls of the, of, the, of the mutation that the uh, the method said that they are real mutations were indeed true mutations. Yes? So this is how you sort of calibrate it, right? Because the delta is sort of trading off accuracy, both positive and both negative. Exactly. So also, by design. it's by design, but, but they also uh, had a very, very low false positive rate uh, of around like one, two mutations per sample. And they indeed designed it based on a specific uh, set of samples, but it was applied after that to, to many, many more. It was proven to have a very similar validation rate. So now that we find uh, all these mutations, from each and every such method, we learned a lot about the disease. And what we mainly learned from this method is now we can take all the cancer types and examine how many mutations they accumulate. And what we saw, so here is uh, each such uh, column is a, is a different mutation type. And this is the frequency of or the rate of mutations in the genome. So we know today that melanoma and lung and, uh, and bladder cancer are the cancer types that accumulate the greatest uh, amount of mutations. Where on the, at the other hand, we have hematological tumors and of course, pediatric tumors. But we also, beyond this large heterogeneity between cancer types, also within a cancer type, within melanoma patients, some of them carry a lot of mutations, and some of them carry much less. And this might be a random uh, piece of information for you, but these things, things were already shown to have be predictive of response to specific type of treatment. So for example, patient that we know that accumulates a lot of mutations have, is more likely to respond to specific type of therapy versus the other. But, but the issue here is that it, it sounds scary, right, that we carry so many mutations. Most of them do not do anything. Uh, and the challenge at this point, after we find all these mutations, is to identify the ones that are actually are more important to the disease, that drive the disease. And to do that, we, we basically, again, look at the population level. So for example, if we have a gene that spans uh, 1,500 bases, and now we have a sample size of 500 such tumors, so overall we have uh, this number of, of overall bases, if the mutation rate, which at, at some point in the past was assumed to be constant, that we have a constant mutation rate in our genome, if it assumes to be like this, like one in a million, we can apply a simple binomial model and ask, okay, now I saw in the population 
m or more mutations uh, and examine basically uh, what is the chances to see that in random or uh, by random or more. But we just saw here that the mutation rate is, is not constant at all. It's, heterogene it's heterogeneous and it's different between individuals and between cancer types. And indeed, MUTESIG, which is the method uh, that was developed to, to address this challenge, uh, knows how to take this heterogeneity into account. And that way, when they applied it, they removed a lot of false positives. When they assumed that the, that the mutation rate is constant, they found many more cancer genes than they would then they, they were really cancer genes. And they spent a lot of time on testing them in the lab, but it, they were not real. So indeed, this method significantly narrowed down uh, the number of genes that we think today, that we hypothesize, that are causing the disease. And now that we have all this, uh, we, know to, we know how to find the mutations, and we, to some extent, know how to point to the ones that are more important, we ask, can we tell what is the biological process? What is generating a subset of mutations in our gene? And I'll take a couple of minutes to understand, uh, to explain this analysis. Uh, this, called, this is called an analysis of mutational process. And it is re represented by this Lego plot. Why Lego and what do we see here? So I remind you, overall, we have four letters in our, uh, in our genome, A, G, C, V, T. This means that we have 12 possible ways to change it from one base to another. And because of the complementary uh, structure of the DNA, each such change, for example, C to T is exactly as G to A. So we can reduce it, we can collapse the, the 12 options into, into six, six options. Um, each of them is represented here by a different color. So overall, you will agree with me, there are six different possible ways of mutations. But here we study the mutations in their context. Which base comes before the mutation, which base comes after the mutation. For example, if this is the reference genome, we had your C. We saw in the disease that it became an A. But we look at the context. We know that before the A there was a T, and after the A there was a G. And this is the context, sorry. And since uh, we are looking on, on two letters, and overall we have four, there are uh, in total six possible uh, combinations. So again, C to A, this is what we're observing here. This is this uh, sort of a blue color in the context of T and G. And here, if we look on this context, T and G is this uh, position. So basically, it means it's this bar. So now, when we get a file with a list of mutations, we can generate this Lego plot, which basically tells us the count, how many mutations uh, of each and every such count. Of overall, there are 96 uh, poss possibilities here. We have in the we have in, in this specific individual. Basically, this is a 96 vector, and our goal is try to break down this pattern and identify processes that uh, are, are uh, shared across different uh, mutations. So this is uh, solved by an NMF approach where again we have these 96 vectors across a population of n samples and we can uh, break down this, uh, this matrix, matrix into different processes. And what do we get? So for example, this is one process that we get. We call this the aging signature because we have the biological knowledge. Uh, th so this, this, these mutations are C to T mutations. These are the, the, the yellow part. When the base after that is a G. We know from biology, sorry, that C to T mutations that happen in positions in the DNA that there's a G afterwards are caused by aging, just because our uh, cells are accumulating this type of mutations. Another example is the UV signature. When we are exposed to UV, we are exposing ourselves to mutations of a very specific kind of C to T mutations, where the base before it is either a C or a T. It's called a pyrimid and it's not that important, but we know that this type of mutation is accumulated specifically by UV. And today we already have 30 such processes that are annotated. And again, why is that important? When, when we take an individual, when we take a patient, we know what's the mutation it carries. And we can apply this method and, uh, and also understand what's the process that, that caused these mutations to happen. And from other studies that people uh, have done, uh, we know that some 
some of these processes tells us if a patient will respond or not respond to a specific type of therapy. This is one of the many, many uh, things that people are talking about in the context of personalized medicine. So overall, I told you about uh, three methods. One, how we detect mutations. Uh, the next one, how we identify the important ones in them. And uh, then how we can identify the mutation process. What's causing these mutations in our gene? And I now want to switch gears and talk uh, about my study, where our goal is to, it's a, in the context of cancer initiation, but I'll jump right into it. So as you know, every research question uh, starts with some gap in our understanding. And the gap I noticed when I, when I joined abroad is that all these fancy and very important projects, they all sequence the, the biopsies of cancer patients. This means that we, what we see, all this mutation, is a snapshot of what, what's happening already when the disease is fully developed. But we know that this is sometimes can be a very long process. People are accumulating these mutations for many, many years and sometimes even a few decades. So looking at a snapshot that is happening many years after means that we cannot tell what were the initiating events. The very first mutations that gave rise to this cancer cell and provided it with its selective advantage. And in order to do that, we might need to start looking at normal cells and see what kind of mutations we accumulate when the cells are completely normal. And indeed, there was one work. Uh, the first one that did that, they took 12,000 uh, in individuals and they sequenced uh, their blood cells. And what they found is that 10% of the individuals over the age of 65 in this case um, had mutations in their, in their cells. But more than that, they had mutations in cancer genes, what we think are cancer genes. And what was nice about this work is that they had, because it's blood, so they had follow-up on these people. They followed them for six years after. And they saw that there was indeed increased risk for developing these type of tumors, hematological tumors in this case, in those individuals where they saw this start, this, this accumulation of mutations uh, a few years before that, when there was no symptoms of the disease, when the cells were completely normal. Um, so at this point, and okay. yes. Frequency. So what we're that is asking is basically how can we differentiate between the somatic and germline mutations? So germline mutations are the ones that are in all our body and we inherit them from one of our parents. So their frequency will be close to 50% because they are coming either from our mother or from our father. Uh, but somatic mutations, they're accumulated in specific cell and their frequency would be much, much long, uh, lower. So they basically, what they did in this work to differentiate between the germline and the somatic was some error models, but was basically on the, so, the frequency. So why, couldn't you, why couldn't they use the original PCGA data yeah. and take the match normal sample they could. and do the same? They could, I think that maybe some of the data you use from there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when we saw this, this work and another work that followed it, we thought, okay, so this is what's going on in blood, but, but, but what's the case for all the other tissues in our body? What's happening in our skin, in our lung, in our pancreas, in our liver? Are they all accumulating this mutation? Uh, is it different between males and females? Is race uh, is a factor here? What's happening with age? So basically, we, want to, we wanted to expand this work to many more, many, many, many more tissues. But at this point, we could only dream about that because there's no such data. Uh, currently in the world, there's no public data uh, that took DNA from normal, uh, normal tissues in our body. They're not taking normal individuals and taking samples from their liver, right? Uh, but we were lucky enough uh, to be part of this consortium. It's called the GTEx project. Uh, this is an NIH project that already actually finished this year, but uh, was around for almost a decade. And what I did in this, in this project is people that have deceased from several reasons that are non-cancer related. So all are cancer free. They died either from accidents or heart disease and things like that. Uh, after the, the families consented to, to, to donate uh, 
samples from the from the uh, from the from the person that had disease. They took around uh, they took samples from around 30 tissues in their body, uh, but specifically they did not sequence the DNA. They sequenced the RNA. Why they did that? Um, simply because they were not interested in my question. They were interested in understanding activity level and expression program in normal tissues. Uh, so this is what they did. But uh, when I saw that and we were aware of this work, okay, maybe we can use the RNA in order to identify these mutations. Because again, it's sequencing read. How complex uh, can it be? And this is what we wanted to do. So I'm first going to tell you about the method we developed to do that and what were the limitations and the challenges in this work. And I will then dis tell you what we found when we, we actually apply this method to all these normal tissues. How much time have to nest the sample taken? Uh, very short. Like, uh, we have the data. Uh, it was mainly a problem in brain samples. Uh, but from the other organs, it was like in the um, interval of few hours. Um, okay, so I remind you that we already have in, in our arsenal a method for detecting mutations. So the first thing we, th we thought, it's called mutex, in case I haven't said that. It's okay, let's apply mutex and see what we get, right? Uh, but in order to, to know if we are right, we need to take samples that have both DNA and RNA. So we can actually compare our result to something. Uh, so this is what we did. We took cancer samples that have both DNA and RNA from the exact same sample, and this is important. Uh, we applied mutex and got two mutation lists from each such sample. We did it across uh, different cancer types, and this is what we saw. The, in red is the amount of mutations uh, we see in DNA, and in blue is the amount of mutation we see from the same cells in RNA. And you can see we see a few orders of magnitude more. Now, this is not biology. This is not real. There's no more mutations in RNA than in DNA. RNA is basically a copy of the DNA. There could be specific changes, not at that scale. Meaning that we are dealing here with a lot, a lot of noise. Basically, it looks like that. So there is an overlap, but there are variants that we see only in the DNA, and you don't see them in the RNA. And this was our first question. Why are there variants that we don't see in the RNA, if it's basically a copy of it? And our bigger problem was how to remove all these noisy sites that we see. So I'll start with the, with the first question. Why are we missing variants uh, when we look on the RNA? So I remind you that the RNA is a copy of the DNA, but only of part of the DNA first. And also, we have this uh, measure of quantity, right? I told you that, that there can be four copies of gene A and six copies of gene B, and this is variant. And sometimes it can be the case that we just don't have enough copies in order to detect the mutations. And so it's basically a problem of statistical power, and I'll explain. So again, if, again, we have all these short trees in the DNA, and this is we are in mutation in frequency of 20%. Now, let's say that our detection threshold, we, we need at least three times to see the mutations to believe it. Now, when we look on the RNA, it means that we need at least 30 reads in order to have sufficient power. Sufficient here, for example, would be above 95%. This is a simple binomial model. And the case in practice is that many times the frequency of the mutation is not large enough in order for it to be sufficient to detect it in the RNA. Because this coverage, what we call it, it's different in every position that we have in the genome. In practice, we, we, this frequency is very noisy because it's, it's affected by both biological reasons and technical noise. I won't get into that. So we modeled it, modeled it using a beta binomial model where this frequency is basically a random variable. And in order to, to identify k, this minimal number of reads, uh, that will be beyond noise, we looked at the, at the normal sample from the same individual. So we can estimate the noise. Why would that be a noise? Because this is a somatic mutation. It exists only in the tumor cells of this patient. It does not exist in his blood. So every changes here that we see is basically coming from noise. 
So we uh, selected K uh, such, such that the uh, such that the number of reads uh, that support it will be uh, will be less than one percent. And the bottom line is this is what we saw. So this is the for example, the number of mutations that we see in DNA, 70% of the mutations we see in DNA, we don't have power to detect them in the RNA. We are not going to see them. There's nothing we can do about it. This is just the limitations that we need to acknowledge. We have here a sensitivity problem. Uh, out of the 30% that we have power to detect, mutex basically detects most of them uh, with this fraction that we can explain by specific biological reasons uh, that are less important for our discussion. So the first conclusion uh, that, uh, that we had is that not all the mutations can be detected in RNA when we need to acknowledge that. But our bigger problem was, again, how can we move, remove all these noisy sites that we see only in the RNA? To do that, we developed the RNA mutect uh, pipeline. So again, we start with mutect. We apply, we get this mutation list that has a lot of noise. Uh, the first thing we did is to, to design a realignment filter that basically extracts all the reads that support the specific mutations and then try to map all of them again to other places in the genome and basically searches for a better mapping. And indeed, there were many cases when we saw that there is a better mapping for this, for this sequencing read and then we kept only the ones that were supported also by the original uh, mapping and by the second mapping. And this reduced a lot, of, a lot of the noise that we saw. Beyond that, we applied what we call the panel of normals. And I'll explain uh, what the panel of normals do by an example. Let's look at this example. This is the tumor, and we are looking at this position. Uh, we see here a few changes from the reference genome. This person has a T here. Uh, despite the fact that it should have something else. We looked at the match normal sample from the same individual, we see nothing. Mutech will tell us, okay, this is a mutation. It's beyond the noise level, et cetera, et cetera. This is a mutation. But now suddenly, I'll give you data from other normal individuals, people that don't have cancer, from their blood, for example. And you look at the same position, and suddenly you see it here, and you see it in this individual, and you see it in this individual. Now we are not so sure that this is a real mutation. If it's happening so many times, or a specific amount of time in other healthy individuals, it might not be uh, a real mutation. And this is basically a filtering process that is based on building an error model for every position that we have in the genome. Because up until this point, we looked, we compared between uh, one set of samples to uh, another set of samples from the same individual. But we did not look on normal individuals from the, from the entire population, so we could not account for technical sequencing noise that are always happening in specific positions in the genome. These are cases that it's related to the machine, to the temperature, to the library preparation, a lot of technical things. But now when we look on many, many individuals, and I'm talking here thousands of individuals, we can build this error model per position and add another layer of information that will help us to be confident in our calling. So using this panel of normals, we basically filtered many more mutations. Beyond that, we also uh, searched in public databases for variants that exist in the, in the, in the entire worldwide population and uh, perform more filtering. Um, there is specific, I didn't say it because it's not that important, but there is specific type of changes that, it, that is happening only in the RNA. But it's not of interest to us. And because there are such databases, we can use them in order to, to remove this type of uh, variant. Another type of filtering that we developed is in the context of duplicate reads. Sometimes we see the exact same read mapped to the, to the, to the, to the exact same position we see mutations it repeating itself many times. And we know that these things might, again, be a result of some biological process and not a real mutation. So there are a bit, a bit more steps that I think that are less important, but the bottom line is that. These are the false positive sites, and we were able to filter out around 99% of the noise. And importantly, and we were very happy about that, 
it barely affected uh, the true variants. All these filtering steps had almost no effects on the variants that we know that are real. And overall, out of the powered side, out of the ones that we had power to detect the mutations in them, we get a sensitivity of a median sensitivity of 70% and a specificity of 90%. And because this is the methods on which we developed all this pipeline, we also applied it to, to another cohort uh, of around 300 samples and got results in terms of sensitivity and specificity that are very similar. And I always uh, like to, to show this plot just because it makes things very clear. This is the um, mutation pattern that, that we had in the DNA. And this is the mutation pattern that we had in the RNA before we applied the filtering. So you can see very different uh, pictures. And this is what happened after we applied our filtering. So you can see now that the, that the pattern is very, very similar. And the next, so the next conclusion that we have is that most of the mutations that we now, after the filtering, say that are real mutations from the RNA are indeed real mutations. But now our problem is as follows. So we have these mutations from the RNA. And let's imagine that there's no DNA in the world. We have only RNA. Can it be informative? Because I remind you, our, we have a sensitivity problem. Only 30% we are able to detect. So the question is whether these 30% are informative. Can we do something with this 30%? And the answer was, you were glad to see that the answer is to some extent, yes. Because I remind you that one of the challenges we have in this field is to point to, out of all the may, many, many mutations, to point to the ones that are, that are more important, that drive the disease. So indeed, when we looked for them, we saw that we are able to identify the important ones only from the RNA. And of course, there are ones that we are missing. We mainly miss them because there is not enough data, in, there's not enough reads that cover this, these genes in our data. And the second result is again in the context of these processes, these mutational signatures. So you can see that we were able to identify the same signatures, it's the same patterns, both from the DNA and from the RNA overall. So our third and last conclusion in this process of developing the method is that yes, using RNA data alone, we can to some extent identify the important parts of things that are happening in cancer genomes. Uh, so can, RNA. Can you sure. try to apply the same, for example, the mutation and analysis or even the detection of blood <coughs> genes to the original mutect on RNA before the filtering? Yes, we got a lot of noise. Yes, uh, we got many. Uh, this list was, was very long and was not true because these were not found in the DNA. And we had here all these processes that no one heard of. Um, so RNA mutect is dockerized and can be run on the cloud. We developed this test um, that it can be run easily in, in our platform. Um, and now I guess it's time to tell you what we found. So now we have the method, we have the data. What do we see in normal tissues? And before I tell you that, I just want to make sure that you're all with me because I know it, this is a lot of material. So what I did... Um, what I did until now is to tell you about the method development part where we used cancer samples, where I had, I had the DNA, I had the RNA, so I could develop the method and compare my results. Now, when I'm, when I'm moving to the normal tissues from GTEx, I don't have the DNA. This is why we started with that, okay? I don't have the DNA, I, I can only trust the method I developed. Bottom line. So this is the number of samples we, we analyze, or around 7,000 from almost 500 individuals. And we were able to identify almost 9,000 mutations in them, uh, which spans around uh, almost 40% of the samples, but 95% of the individuals, meaning that from every individual, at least one of his tissues, carry, we, we, we were able to detect this mutation. But now we can put them all in this, in this uh, axis of different tissues again. So every such column or color is a different tissue. And this is the y-axis, the number of mutations. 
And the first thing we saw, which is what was reassuring for our method, is that the tissues that uh, accumulate the greatest amount of mutations are the skin, the lung, and the esophagus. Why? Because they are exposed to environmental factors, right? These are the, the main three tissues that are exposed to these factors. In terms of, uh, we ask, is there a difference between males and females? Maybe there's a specific tissue that male are generating more mutations in it or, or not. The only one that we could find, and maybe also not surprisingly, is the breast, because the, um, the breast of a male is mainly composed of, of fat cells. Fat cells are not uh, proliferative, they are not accumulating mutations, as opposed to female breast that has this, it's called the epithelial layer. And this layer of um, cell type is, is the one from which cancer arises. Another interesting thing is to see what's going on with age, right? So in our cohort, we had um, individuals from the age of 20 to the age of 70. We took the middle, the middle was 45, and we asked whether uh, people above the age of 45 have more mutations than those that are younger. And we did, we saw this signal. Both when we're looking at, at all the mutations that an individual carry in all of his body, but also when we looked specifically on these aging mutations. I don't know if you remember, I told you at the beginning that we know that there is a specific type of mutations here that are represented by these bars that we accumulated just because of the aging process. So indeed, we, we, we now can see signs of it in, our, in the data. Another factor that can affect uh, uh, the chance of our tissues to, to accumulate mutation is the proliferation rate. Some of our tissues are regenerating all the time and our, uh, replic the DNA is replicated and the cell is divided and some can be replicated once in every few years or even not that. So there is a proxy uh, uh, to tell how much a uh, tissue is proliferative. It's basically the expression of one gene called K67 and we saw a trend. It's definitely not perfect, but we saw a trend such that tissues that are more proliferative, that are doing more of these replications, are accumulating much more mutations. The other uh, piece of information, which might not come as a surprise to you, but it's really nice to see the data here. Uh, when we look on the skin, there are, we have uh, skin samples uh, um, that was exposed to sun or that was not exposed to sun. And this is, these are the differences. So this is the number uh, on average of mutations that we accumulate uh, in the skin that was exposed to sun. And this is what we accumulated in uh, skin samples that were not exposed to sun. You can see that there are big difference. And the red, uh, sorry, the red, the blue versus the, the gray part tell us the process. So as I told you, we know how mutations that arise from UV signature looks like. These are these mutations. And the blue part, tells us the majority of the mutations in sun-exposed skin are indeed happening from the UV. Simple as that. And now we have information in our data also about race. So we have European ancestry and we have African Americans. Note, it's, a, it's confusing, but note the scale of these bars. So this is up to 200 here and this is only up to six. This is European ancestry, this is African Americans. We, um, African, yeah, so, so European ancestry accumulate dozens and, and hundreds of mutations uh, in their DNA, while African Americans do not uh, accumulate any mutations in their skin, regardless if it's exposed or not exposed to sun. This is something about the biology and the architecture of, their, of, their, of the uh, darker skin uh, tissue. So these are the differences. So this, for us, um, these are things that we expected, but since we did not have the DNA here, each and every such step told us, okay, so, so the calling, the, the mutations that you, that you found might be, a real, uh, might be real ones, because they are telling us all these biological stories that we expect to see. But next we were wondering, okay, so what's, we are, we are interested in cancer research, and we ask all these questions in the context of cancer. What are the differences from what we are familiar from cancer? And we looked on, on the four different areas. First is the frequency of the mutations. So what's happening in cancer? In cancer, when we take a biopsy, uh, I put it in simple words, but most of the cells 
have a specific mutation. This means that their frequency would be around 0.5 because it's on one of the alleles, either from our one mother or from our father, so the frequency would be around 5%, 0.5, sorry. And this means that there are clonal mutations that are happening in all the cells uh, of the cancer. When we look on normal tissues, the, the clones, the cells that carry the mutation, and this is important to understand, they are microscopic. They are not big. They are not of all, in, within all the cells, and we can uh, quantify this by this allelic frequency, which is here you can see it's around 5%. So it means that when we take um, a normal tissue, not all of the cells will carry the mutation, but 5% and even less will carry the mutation. And this is one very big difference from what we see in cancer, obviously. If it was in all the cells, we would probably already see the disease. But the next thing we, we, we thought about is, okay, I did not tell you that, but there are different types of mutations. Some of these changes would actually change the, the, the protein, the functional unit of the cell, and some of them would be what we call silent mutations. They would not do anything. So the first thing we thought is, okay, maybe all the mutations that we find in normal tissues are silent mutations. They're not really doing anything. But this is not what we saw. So this is cancer data. This is normal data. And the different colors are different types of mutations. So the red ones are the ones that are changing our proteins. And you can see that they are the majority, both in the cancer sam samples and also in the normal samples. And in general, we see a very similar distribution of the mutation type between cancer and normal. Okay, so again, so you carry the mutation, but, but are they the, the interesting one? Are they the deleterious one? What's going on? So we looked at a database that contained around 500 genes that mutations in these genes have been causally implicated in cancer. We know that they are causal of the disease. And we look specifically in this, uh, in this set and we find that 3% um, of the samples, but third uh, of the individuals carry a non-silent mutations. I remind you, a non-silent means it changes the protein in, in their normal tissue. So we have here mutations that change the protein in a gene that we know that is causing cancer. And we saw uh, specific, so here are the different tissues, and specifically we saw five tissues that are enriched with these genes, that have more than you would expect by random. But again, another piece of information, and almost the last one, is that, so T53 uh, is a known cancer gene, okay? But T53 is a gene of, I don't know, how many bases? And we know today that specific positions in these genes are, cause, are more causal, causal of, of the disease, not all the positions. And this position called hotspot mutations because this is specific spots that we know are causal. So after looking at the gene level, we looked for specifically to see if we have in our data hotspot mutations. And yes, we saw these mutations. We saw around uh, 30 of them across 12 genes. And to th we, we cannot tell for sure, of course, but we have signs that tell us if, it's, it, if a mutation uh, is important it will make the cell grow faster, and therefore its frequency would be higher than other mutations. And indeed, we saw that these hotspot mutations have a higher frequency than other mutations in these cells. And this, is, this implies to us that they are really making the cell more proliferated. And this is a feature we are familiar from cancer. And the last result that we have is in the context of Copy number variation, and what is that? Beyond point mutations, so yes, there are uh, changes in our genome that a specific base is changed to a different one. But as I told you at the beginning, sometimes there are genetic events that are happening at the chromosome level. So it can be that the entire chromosome or part of the chromosome is duplicated or deleted, and we see many of those in cancer. And we ask whether we can identify these events also from the RNA and not just from the DNA. And we thought, yes, there is a way to do that. And this is, this is how we do that. that. So I told you about these germline mutations, right? And germline mutations are, appear in our genome in a one-to-one -one ratio because they are either from our mother or from our father. But when a chromosome is amplified or deleted, 
this ratio is basically changed. Now it could be 2 to 1, 3 to 1, uh, or something else. The data is very noisy, and this is what you can see here. So for every ch such germline mutation, we expect a frequency that would be around 0.5. So this is our entire genome from chromosome 1 till 222. And these are each dot represents this germline mutation that we expect to be around 0.5%. So it's noisy. This is, but this is from a normal sample. And what we did is to look for cases when we see that. You can see pretty clearly, I see, that there is something going on, going on here. We call it allelic imbalance. Uh, we cannot tell what, if it was amplified or deleted, but something happened. And we do that by fitting a beta distribution, looking for these cases that uh, significantly uh, deviate from this, uh, from this distribution. And we indeed found um, eight cases, specifically from the esophagus, that has this 9Q. This is a specific region in chromosome 9 that had this allelic imbalance. And when we looked at the literature, we saw that there are studies that saw this 9Q, it was deletion in their case, but they saw it in, in the esophagus, but they saw it in dysplasia. Dysplasia is a precancer stage uh, that do not necessarily transform into cancer. Uh, and we barely see it in esophagus cancer. So there could be genetic events that we, we, we think about today as cancerous, but they do not lead into the disease. And this is important uh, from the following reason that I will say now. So not much to summarize, we basically developed a method for calling mutations from RNA, which allowed us to look at a large number of normal tissues uh, where we identified a lot of cancer genes and things that we are familiar from cancer. And what does it all mean? So in my eyes, it means two things. First, what we think about is cancer gene might not be a cancer gene. And when we search for cancer genes, we, we need to take the normal background into account. This is something people did not do at, up to this point because the data did not exist. But now this kind of data is accumulating. There's a new project of the NIH that is now sequencing pre-cancer uh, tissues. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that this will uh, be a routine procedure in the future. Uh, but mainly what it, what, what it means is that it significantly complicates our efforts to do early detection because early detection is based on identifying these genetic changes and saying, okay, this is, a, this is a genetic change that we see in cancer. But now that we see it also in normal samples, we need to rethink about the ways that we do early detection. I don't think there are um, solutions for that. I have till 1.30. Yes? Can or? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I do have time to tell you only in two slides, and I'm telling you that only because I think it's a very interesting story. And I'm going to tell you about our uh, aim to identify resistance mechanism to a specific type of therapy. I'm sure you all heard about it uh, in some way or another. Uh, this is called immunotherapy, and this is what uh, was the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, in medicine, and I'm going to tell you a short biological story before I tell you what we did. So I'm sure you now know that when people, uh, when a person is, uh, has cancer, it carries specific mutations in its DNA. Luckily, our immune cells knows how to identify these mutations, and it can kill the cell. And we don't have proof th for that, but we believe that the fact that we don't get more cancer is simply because the immune system is traveling in our body, identifying these mutations and killing these cells while they are still small. However, tumor cells are super smart, and they also can express this, this protein that when the, the immune cells see this protein, it immediately becomes dysfunctional. It can no longer see the tumor cell. It can no longer kill the tumor cell. And this new immunotherapy that everyone is talking about is working by blocking this interaction. And that way, the immune cell is, is active again and can kill the cell. And this is amazing. We see amazing responses. People have their tumor completely regress. However, still, many people do not respond to the treatment. 
and also the one that responded many times developed this resistance. So one of the great challenges is the, in this field is to, to figure out why do patients do not respond to treatment. And most importantly, can we predict that a priori? Because this type of therapy has horrible side effects. It puts all of our immune system on fire. We get a lot of autoimmunity. These people are in suffering. So, and this was already approved as first line of treatment, for example, in melanoma. This is the drug that they, that they get immediately. And if 60, 70% of them are not responding to the treatment, we are wasting their time and we cause them a lot of misery. To answer this question, we generated this really unique data because we took uh, biopsies from patients, uh, from melanoma patients, before the therapy, after the therapy, some of them responded to treatment, some of them did not respond to treatment. But as opposed to everything I, I told you um, <coughs> until now, we, we, what we usually do when we take the biopsy and we sequence it, what we see is an average expression of around millions of cells. And new technologies are um, enable us to do the exact same thing, but at the single cell level. We can now know in each and every single cell in the biopsy of the patient what's going on. Uh, so this is our data. It covers around 60,000 single cells and different genes. And again, our goal is to find groups of these different cells that share a specific signature. And then see if these groups are more frequent in patients that responded, patients that did not respond. Can you identify predictors, specific genes here that can tell us if a patient will respond? So I'm going to show you the result again, only in one slide. Uh, this is the data. This is just the dimensionality reduction plot where you can see all the 16,000 cells and they are colored around, uh, based, on the, based on the groups that we found. This is the basic clustering method. And after we found these uh, 11 and robust clusters, we asked, for example, is the, um, the purple group, we see it more in responding patient or we see it more in non-responding patient? Well, there is, there is such signal in our data. And indeed, we saw that there are three groups that we either see more in responding or in non-responding patient. When we looked on these cells, this was a specific type of cells, biological cells. We zoomed in only on this population and we tried to cluster them again. And indeed, we saw that there are two main groups in these cells. Uh, one that is uh, that based, based on the genes that are active in this group, we know that these cells are exhausted. They are no non-functional. And while the blue group are good cells, they're, 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 they have activation function. We call them the bad and the good cells, for simplicity. And what we found is that in every patient that we looked, we had both the good cells and the bad cells, not just one of them. But the ratio between them, if you had more good or more, more bad cells, was a very good predictor of response. So you can see here, this is for all the samples. This is log 10 scale, so above zero means more good cells. Below zero is more uh, um, bad cells. And you can see the significant difference between responding and non-responding patients. And overall, uh, this, this simple score, this ratio, was a very good predictor of response. Technically, practically, in the clinic, we are not going to be able to do single cell for every patient. This is a laborious work, it's super expensive, it's not going to happen. We need to find something that is more clinically practical. And in order to do that, you need to zoom in on specific genes or a combination of genes that you can perform a specific and easy experiment on and you can tell that that would be predictive enough. And indeed, from the analysis of the data, we were able to identify two genes that when they express together, and here you can see uh, the imaging, so when, for, for your purposes, it's, it's the, when the green and the, um, and the pink, when we see them together in this image analysis, we believe that the patient will respond, and when we see only the green without the, without the pink one, the patient will most likely will not respond. And indeed, we quantified, uh, we quantified this from the image analysis, and this was indeed found to be a very good predictor of response that is now being used in the clinic, because this is very simple. You take a biopsy, you do this histology, this is a few bucks experiment that we are trying to, to now uh, improve, but is already tested at, at MGH, at the clinic. 
So before I go into three sides of future plans, I want to acknowledge all the people that I worked with uh, in my past talk, people from Gaddy's group, the GTEx team, uh, the, the Akon lab, specifically Moshe, and a lot of clinicians from MGH, from the hospital. And I'm going to quickly uh, tell you what I want to do um, in my future lab. So I think you all know now that this is what interests me, how a normal cell become a tumor cell, uh, and specifically, I'm interested in three axes in this process. What's happening to the DNA in this process? What's happening to the RNA? How does it change it? And how the immune system um, is basically contributing to this process? So my first project, um, after we characterize what's going on in the tumor, and we now know much more on the genetic changes that is happening in the normal, the question is what drives a normal cell to become a tumor one? And this. To me, the finding that we, we find now cancer genes in normal tissues, the main thing it, it tells me, I might be wrong, that this is a question of combination. So for example, gene A, we know it's a cancer gene. We see it in tumor in a specific combination. We never see one mutation. We see it gene A plus A, B, C, and D. But now in normal, we see gene A, but we see it in a different combination. And the question that I ask myself is that we, whether we can find the combination of genetic operations that result with disease. To do that, because the space of combination is, is large, we need a lot of data first, and we need computational tools, of course. And the idea is basically to model the genetics and of each such either normal or cancer cell and build these smart and biologically driven features that will help the, based obviously on machine learning uh, techniques, um, identify these combinations of mutations that will lead to malignancy. And what such, is, such this magic tool can, can bring us is now given a new sample, think about early detection, think about the future. Now given a new sample, we can tell with some probability what, probability, what are the chances of it to become cancer. And more than that, we can do some simulation. We can uh, start with a sample that has a only one mutation, and you can add or delete and, and do all this kind of simulation and run them through the model to identify whether this would result with malignancy. Another thing that interests me is, again, in the context of mutations and RNA, but one knowledge that we, we, that we are lacking today is, okay, so we have a cell with a specific, specific genetics. How, phenotypically, how it would look like? What would, it, would be the expression levels? Uh, and up until now, we could not do that because, as I told you, what we see is always the average. We, we, it's basically a mixture of million cells what we see. But now, with new technologies of single cells, we can extract this information from one cell. So, for example, if we have single cell RNA, we can know what's the expression level. This is what we usually do with RNA. But using the method I developed, we can now also know the genetics of this one single cell. And there are many, I'm not sure you completely got what I wanted to say, but, but there are many challenges here because when we're dealing with single cell, technically we are dealing with very low input of material. So the coverage is shallow. And when we see mutation, we cannot say in confidence that this is a mutation. When we don't see mutations, we don't know if we it's really not there or we just don't see it because of technical reasons. So we will need to, to build these probab probabilistic models in order to estimate that. And then we will may, might be ad advanced some uh, of our understanding of this genotype phenotype interaction. And lastly, and this is my last slide, I want to go much deeper into this field of immunotherapy, which is indeed promising, but there's so much that we don't know. And we have data that was collected, collected at the, the hospital from other types of cancer, not just melanoma, from lung, head and neck, all the clinical trials that are currently done in the hospital. And to improve, build more predictors and improve our way uh, to, to, to know in advance who will respond or who will not respond to treatment. And there are more challenges here uh, because the, this is an ecosystem. Our tumor cells live there, our immune cells live, live in our in our body and they are all competing for resources and we can now, using all this data, we can do all this mathematical modeling and 
examine the balance between these populations, uh, mainly using metabolic models, which is, as some of you remember, is what I did uh, in my PhD. That's it. On a personal note, uh, I really like the view of Boston and uh, after the snow, know why it's happening, uh, but I much rather be here in the sun. So it's fun to be here and it's good to be back home. Thank you. Um, so, so the the error model is built ar from around 10,000 individuals. They are from different races. Absolutely, there are more European ancestry there. Um, it might change. I completely agree. It might change if we will have more, and if, if it will be more diverse. Uh, but this is what we have now, and we also have a way to test that, right? So we saw that when we apply this error model, it removes a lot of the false positive. And but the bottom line, I did not say that that per sample that we, that we had, we had two or three mutations that we saw only in the RNA. And to be conservative, I'm telling you this is false positive. So, but this, these are the numbers. It's only two or three mutations that are false in every such call that we make. Absolutely not. Um, I would not recommend anyone apply RNA mutect when it has DNA, and mainly because of the, the coverage. I told you that we, are, we, are, we have power only in 30% of the cases, so we are mainly missing information. But why is it good for? Because now if you look on databases around the world, there are much more RNA sequencing around there in the world. Many people are more interested in the function, and this is why they sequence the RNA and not the DNA. So this means that there is a lot of data out there that doesn't have DNA, that we can now utilize uh, for other purposes. But if you have DNA, definitely don't use that. 